our first few chapters are already up, 18, 19, 20, 21. Again, like I mentioned on Monday, my goal is to get through all four of these chapters before the first exam. So let's move forward with the assumption that these uh, chapters will be on the first test. Um, sound off. If we don't get through all of it before the exam, remember I told you guys we won't move the exam date, we'll just change the content. Okay, so just one day at a time with that. All right, you guys ready to start talking about evolution? The enthusiasm is palpable, you guys. Um, oh, I do want to point out that you guys have study guides. So every chapter has its own. And those have been very helpful for students in the past. So those are up for you as well. They're all going to be structured in the same way. I don't think I showed these to you guys on Monday. Um, but you get a list of terms to know. So basically vocabulary words, um, key terms from the chapter, and then a list of key concepts, just bullet points. And there are quite a few right, from some of these chapters. The evolution chapters are long, because there's a lot to talk about. Um, but if you can go through these study guides and you know the definitions of the terms and you can answer or speak to each one of these bullets under concepts, you're going to kill it on the exam. Okay, so this is a list of the things you should take away from each of the chapters, and they coincide with the PowerPoint notes. Okay, so those are up as well. I don't think I showed you guys these either on Monday. If you can poke around and find stuff on your own too. So each chapter has its own PowerPoint. Um, and these are the notes that I used to lecture from. So I will um, talk to you about these slides in class, and you have access to them on D2L, and you have a study guide that walks you through them. Okay, so you have lots of resources to help you know what you're supposed to um, know for the course. Questions, comments, concerns? So chapter 18 will kick us off here. Evolution and origin of species. So I think when I asked on Monday, if anybody remembered covering um, evolution in bio one, like one person raised their hand. So this is probably, some of it will be new. Um, some of this material may be stuff that you've seen um, in previous biology classes, even in high school. Um, but some of it will be probably the first time you've heard it. So we're just gonna go through and make sure everybody's on the same page. One of the things that I was talking about Monday, sorry, I forgot to plug in my little clicker thing, um, is how this whole course is built on this foundation of an understanding of how evolutionary processes shape biodiversity, right? So we're going to go through all the chapters on all the different um, families and kingdoms and groups of organisms. We're going to talk about how they all work together as a biology unit. But before we can do that, we have to really understand evolution and the processes that drive these changes in um, biological systems, right, <laughs> and organisms. So we're going to make sure that we have a really strong foundation in understanding evolutionary theory. Good? You ready? All right. Um, another interesting thing that we'll get to, probably not today, but maybe next Wednesday. Yes, I Um, is misconceptions about evolution. So you may have heard things uh, about evolution that may or may not be true, or may or may not be completely true, or there may be some sort of discussion to be had about these things, okay? So one of the major things that we'll talk about is that the misconception about evolution is that it explains the origin of life, okay? It doesn't, right? That's a different area of science, biology, physics, right? There are people who are looking for that. What happened first? Where did it all come from? When we talk about evolution, we're talking about the origin of species, right? So the difference between the origin of life and the origin of species is significant, and that's important. It's an important distinction to make when we start talking about evolution. So species are, what is a species? Okay, yeah, now? Anybody want to be brave and throw out a definition of a species? Yeah, like Homo sapien, for example, right? That's humans, yes? Um, so we'll talk about what the definite, what defines the species, biological species concepts and things like that. Um, but really what a species is, is just a group of organisms, very specific way to classify organisms. 
things, right? You are this, you are this, you are this, right? Um, so when we're talking about the origin of species, we're talking about where these different groups came from. Not necessarily how did it all did it all start, but how do do organisms diverge from one another so far that you become a different species? Okay, so we'll get into that in quite a bit of detail um, as we move through this. So I'm going to have you guys draw a little bit on your knowledge of um, genetics that you picked up in Bio One. So remember, I told you Monday, I'm going to ask you to recall right a lot of things that you've that you've learned in the past. And if you can't remember some of this stuff, we're going to catch everybody up to the same to the same foundation. So I want you guys to learn this definition, this first bullet point. This is really important, and we're going to come back to it over and over again. Okay, uh, the definition of evolution. There are lots of ways to define evolution. This is the most uh, succinct one that I like the best, and so that's where we're going to start. So evolution is the change in allele frequencies in the gene pool of a population of organisms over time due to natural selection and other influential mechanisms, right? Perfect. Moving on. Just kidding. Let's break it down and talk about what this actually means. So um, let's talk about a population of organisms. Okay, so when you're talking about an organism, you're talking about probably one species. When we throw in the word population, we're definitely talking about one species. So a population of organisms is a group of the same species that interact with each other, okay? So how you define a population depends on the question that you're asking. And you can look at the population of pine trees on campus. You can look at the population of homo sapiens in Cartersville, in North America, in the world, All right? So depending upon what level you're looking at, you can define a population in a lot of ways. But a population of organisms basically just means one group, one species that interact with each other. In this case, we're talking about the gene pool of a population of organisms. What is the gene pool? If a, if a population is just a group, what's the gene pool of that group? It is. It's the defining characteristics, but it's the genetic underpinnings of those defining characteristics. So it's the DNA, basically. It's all of the options for those characteristics that define that population at the molecular level, all right? So the gene pool is basically just all of the genes. Take all of the DNA and put it in a bucket and you've got the gene pool, okay? So when you have a population, one of the ways that we define uh, a species is that, that organisms that are in the same species can interbreed. Right? They can reproduce, they can make more of their own kind. If you're in a population, you're uh, hypothetically interacting, so you should be able to reproduce. So the gene pool is basically the selection of genetic material that's available to the next generation of that species in that population. Does that make sense? All right. So when you're talking about the gene pool, you're just talking about all the different uh, genes, including different alleles of those genes. Okay, so this is more terminology that I'm asking you to recall from bio one. What's an allele? Anybody? Yeah. A version. A version, yeah, for sure. It's like, okay, um, let's pretend for simplicity's sake that the color of your eyes is determined by a single gene. It's not, it's more like 14 or 16 different genes that contribute to it, but let's just, for the sake of simplicity, call it one. So let's say you have a gene for eye color. Every organism in the population has a gene for eye color, okay? In our example, you might have the, uh, the allele for green eyes, you might have the allele for blue eyes, and you might have the allele for brown eyes, right? But you all have one allele. They might be different. They're variants. They're versions, okay? So when we're talking about allele frequencies, we're just building it up here, you guys. Allele frequencies means how often or how frequently do you see a particular allele or a particular version of the gene in the gene pool of a population. So in other words, back to our eye color example, how many alleles for blue eyes are in the bucket? Yes? How many alleles for brown eyes are in the bucket? How frequently do you see that allele? And those alleles, remember, are just the genetic underpinnings of the physical characteristics, the genotype under the phenotype. You guys remember those terms? Phenotype, phenotype? Okay, so keeping, keeping momentum going forward here, evolution talks about the changes in allele frequencies 
from one generation to another. So it changes in the frequency in the gene pool of the population over time. That means from one generation to the next generation to the next. Okay, so that's dynamic. That's going to change. Sometimes it changes slowly, and sometimes it changes more uh, rapidly. And those changes are influenced by influential mechanisms. Yes, things like natural selection. Okay, things like mutation, things like um, gene flow. Okay, so we're going to define and talk about what all of those influential mechanisms are as well. But these are things that influence living populations. That is why biology is my favorite of the natural sciences because it's always changed, right? It's dynamic, populations are always changing, organisms are always changing. You can make predictions, but there's always going to be an exception to the rule, just like the most interesting science, right? Of course. Clearly. Okay, so don't really get my finger yet. I don't think it's okay. It's okay. We'll get there. You guys are going to be like, she's so funny. Great. Anyway, so you guys get the definition. The change in the wheel frequencies in the gene pool of the population over time due to these mechanisms. So we're looking at all of these allele frequencies changing that leads to this next bullet, the process through which characteristics of a species change and through which new species arise. All right. So you take these alleles, you take some influential mechanism that selects for or selects against that particular trait. That, that gene, that allele for that gene codes for. Let's can stick with the eye color thing. Let's say there's some influential mechanism. Let's say it's a predator prey thing. Okay, let's say that um, organisms in our population that have blue eyes are more likely to be caught by a predator. You guys with me so far? So now we have an influential mechanism in terms of predation that makes it more likely for you to die if you have blue eyes in this population, okay, for some reason. Maybe you can't see at night, maybe you're short <coughs> running, you know, right? you're just making stuff up. So you have an allele that is under some sort of selective pressure, okay, in this case it's predation pressure. So from one generation to the next, if the blue eyed allele makes you more likely to die before you reproduce, you are less likely to reproduce and pass on that blue eyed allele. You guys with me? So you start to see fewer and fewer blue-eyed individuals of this species over time because of that mechanism, of that selective pressure of predation on blue-eyed individuals. You guys all with me? Okay? That's a change in the wheel frequency. So if you count your population geneticists and you go back to the gene pool and you count the alleles of all the individuals in the population of for eye color, and one generation has a whole bunch of blue, right? And the next generation has fewer because this new predator has come along that eats them, right? So the next generation has even fewer. So you're looking at a change in the frequency of alleles in the blue eyed, uh, blue eyed trait. Yes? Okay? So you're looking at these changes. Well, over time, what might happen to that blue eyed allele? Do you think? It could totally go away, right? So it could disappear. So that would be a change in the characteristic. Maybe now, 10 generations down the line, you have a new, the same population, but now there are no blue-eyed individuals, right? It's just a change in the characteristic. That's a very small example, but over lots of generations and lots of different types of influential mechanisms, you see these characteristics and populations change enough to the point where you actually end up with separate species. We're going to talk about those processes and how that can actually happen. Um, because it is kind of a far reach right, to just throw it out there and say, poof, new species. We're going to talk about the way that that actually occurs a little bit further down the line, but that's where we're going with this. So when you're talking about evolution, you're not talking about one organism changing into another, okay? That's another common misconception about evolution, but what you're talking about is these gradual changes in the traits that you see in a particular population over time due to these mechanisms of natural forces that are shaping that population until you see changes that can, not always, but can lead to the origin of a new species. All right, so that's where we're going. That's the basis of everything we're talking about here with evolution. Um, sorry, my kids, I think, squished my helmet in the car. Now it's like doing weird things. Okay, um, evolution is ongoing. It's always happening because there are always mechanisms. 
natural forces at work. There's always competition. There's always predation. There's always changes in the environment, right? Food availability. All these different things that are constantly evolving, constantly changing, um, are influencing living populations, which is why evolution is always happening. You may also hear evolution referred to as a unifying theme of biology or the unifying theory of biology because everything in biology is related back to it in some way or another. If you go back down, all the way down here to this quote, Theodosius Dobzhansky is a famous geneticist. Um, he wrote a really pretty cool essay on this topic from which this, co this quote comes. If you're interested, there's a link I'll take you right here. I think it's a Wikipedia page um, about this famous essay. But one of the things that he says is that nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution. So basically what he's saying is that there's no other way to explain changes that we see in populations. So it's an interesting sort of side note if you are um, into sort of evolutionary history, the history of evolutionary thought. We'll talk about it a little bit, but anyway. Um, so it's a unifying theme. Evolution explains unity and diversity. That sounds like uh, a complete conflict, right? So um, diversity, meaning the different organisms that we find on the planet, right? So we all get that way through these gradual processes of change. But what about the unity part? What's the, what's the one molecule that all living things share in common? Hmm? It's carbon is an element, right? So we're talking about a biological molecule, the, the blueprint, DNA, right? So that's where the unity comes in because when we're talking about these changes, that are influenced by environmental conditions over time, we're talking about DNA. So evolution explains the relatedness of all organisms because they all come from a single common ancestor, right? We don't know what that was specifically. People are working on that too. But the unifying theme is that four digit code, right? A, C, T, and G, yes? To put that, that build different combinations of nucleotides that build your DNA molecule. Every living thing uses the same series of nucleotides. Right? So that unity is also part of talking about evolution. Are you guys starting to see how this ties everything in biology together? Okay. Um, and then understanding the principle that all life has evolved and diversified from a common ancestor provides a framework from which to ask questions and investigate predictions about the living world. That's the whole unifying theory of biology thing. Right, so we understand this relatedness, but we also understand the diversity and every question in biology is related back to that concept in some way, okay? Um, so we'll talk more about all this. This is just a very broad introduction and a very important foundation on which to build the rest of everything we're talking about, okay? Question, make sense? Now I'm gonna refer back to this uh, definition like a hundred times. So you'll get it really, you'll probably have it memorized by the end of the semester. All right, so how did we all start thinking about this? Well, it's not a new idea. Um, there are lots of, of scientists and naturalists and theologians and philosophers that have added to the sort of knowledge or, or thinking about evolutionary theory over the years. Um, who do you think of when you think of evolutionary theory? Charles Darwin, yeah, he gets like all the credit, yes? Um, but there are others that sort of came before him. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So he built some of his ideas on things that had come before, um, before his work. So it starts with Aristotle, one of the earliest examples. So Aristotle was an early philosopher, right? And he was really interested in the natural world and he looked at the things around him and he noticed things like, hey, these weird ocean animals look like these other weird ocean animals. And it starts asking questions about species and why they are the same in some places, but different in other places, right? And his sort of limited ability to travel back in ancient, uh, ancient Greece. So he wasn't going super far. So some of these later naturalists were traveling more widely and asking the same questions, but it kind of begins with, uh, with those early philosophers. In the 18th century, naturalists begin to reintroduce these ideas, looking back at the ancient philosophers and saying, hey, this is interesting stuff, and asking these questions. Also, people started to find things that didn't make sense, like fossils. So people, when people first started finding fossils, and they didn't know 
what these animals or plants or other organisms were, there was a, a question that arises, right? Which is, what is this thing and where did it go? It was obviously here before. It's not here now. What happened to that species? That sounds like kind of an elementary question, doesn't it? It's kind of based on what we know now about extinction and changes in species and stuff, but people didn't know that right, back in the 18th century. Um, the sort of accepted idea at the time was that species are immutable, meaning they don't change, that everything was, was put here for a purpose in its environment and it's fit to its environment because it's created to be there and nothing ever changes and that's how it is, right? So there's an interesting um, overlap between natural thought and religious thought back then, right? And there still is, which is kind of an interesting topic to talk about as well. But the idea that species don't change was pretty tightly held. And so when these people start coming along and saying things like, maybe they do, it was controversial. Lots of, uh, lots of, met with lots of arguments. So a couple of people who I want you guys to be familiar with their name, just about the evolutionary, uh, sort of the trajectory of evolutionary thought. Um, Leclerc, we'll just, this guy, George Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, that's a big name, a big mouthful. Let's just call him Leclerc, okay? So he was a, a French naturalist and he noticed things like, if you go to different geographic regions that have similar environments, they may still have different organisms. So like, if you have to, <laughs> How do I want to say this? Um, you may be in one area of the tropics and see one kind of toucan, but you go to another area of the tropics and there are different types of toucans. So his, his question becomes, if every organism is uniquely created to live in its particular environment, then how come when you go from this one environment to another similar environment that organisms are different, right? Does that make sense? So there are differences in organisms, even though they live in similar environmental conditions. So that was one of his big questions and sort of one of the things that he started asking about. Um, and then you've got Hutton and Lyell. So James Hutton is older, was older. He's a geologist. What does geology have to do with biology? Fossils, for sure. And your environment that you live in changes as a result of geological changes as well, yes? So it's all sort of tied together. So Hutton is saying uh, geological change happens gradually due to small changes over time, which again, seems like, well, we know that, right? But back then, we didn't. Um, the more popular idea of how things formed like rivers and mountains and uh, oceans and lakes and any sort of major geological landform was that it was the result of a catastrophe of some kind. So catastrophism was sort of the going idea that it was a, a major earthquake or a huge flood or some giant exploding volcano that formed everything. And that everything was formed rapidly and violently um, in a very short period of time. So there was also this idea that the earth was pretty young on the order of like 10,000 years or so, okay? Now we know that it's way older than that. Anybody know how old the earth is? What's the age of the earth now that we have sort of um, scientifically come to? Anybody know? Any guesses? How old is this rock we live on? About 4.6 billion, 4.7 billion, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, that's really old, you guys. Billion? <laughs> that's a lot of years, right? So the idea that James Hutton came up with was that maybe the Earth is older than we think it is, and maybe things change slowly, and what may seem like a major feat of geological change, like the Grand Canyon, didn't happen because of a huge earthquake that ripped the earth apart, but rather by the river flowing through it for a really long time. So this is like radical thinking on the part of this guy back in the 18th century. So um, a little bit later, Charles Lyell comes along and he's a student of Hutton and he's reading what Hutton is uh, writing and he's sort of learning from his ideas and he's pushing it. He's popularizing what Hutton is saying. And he's also tying in the biology of it. And he's saying, if the earth is old, older than we think it is, and if these geological changes happen slowly and gradually, and these large scale changes are just accumulations of small scale changes, what if that applies to living things as well? 
So he going back to the early uh, naturalists who were finding fossils and asking questions about extinct species, and he's saying maybe living things change over time too, and maybe they do it really slowly. Because if the Earth is changing slowly and it's really old, maybe there's time for living things to do the same. So you guys see how the ideas are gradually accumulating, kind of like geological changes, to build to where uh, Darwin has something to sort of work on. Does that make sense? So there, there are more players in this game than what we sort of learn about um, when we just start talking about Darwin in this book. So um, I want you guys just to know who Hutton and Lyle are, just, just basically know that they were geologists, that they had something to do with the um, shift in thinking about the age of the earth and, and gradualism as opposed to catastrophism. Is that fair? Those terms okay? Okay. Um, and just know that Leclerc was an early naturalist. So just sort of be familiar with those people's names. You'll see them on the study guide, so um, that should be helpful. Um, so Darwin is reading Lyle, and Darwin has some of Lyle's books with him when he goes sailing on the Beagle, right, to the Galapagos and, and other uh, ports of interest. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, another influential evolutionary thinker is Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and Lamarckian evolution is still something that we discuss in biology classes and something that we still talk about in terms of um, evolutionary biology. He was really influential and really important because he was the first person to come out and say, yes, species change over time and here's how it happens. So he's the first guy who actually proposes a mechanism right, by which this occurs. Um, he was not right, <laughs> but that's less important right, than the fact that he tried. Um, so he publishes a book based on the mechanism that he describes uh, as use and disuse. And okay? saying that structures that you use a lot will get stronger or bigger. And the structures that you don't use very much will sort of disappear over time. It's not too far off, right? We know that some things happen like that. Like, let's say you break your arm and it goes into cast for eight weeks. When your cast comes off, is your muscle smaller than it was or bigger? Smaller, right? So wasting is a thing. So he's not too far off from this. Um, but where he kind of went wrong, where Lamarck was a little bit off the base, um, off base, is that he said that these changes in individual anatomy or physiology could be passed along to subsequent generations. We call it inheritance of acquired characteristics. So that's basically saying, like, I break my arm, it goes in a cast. Uh, during that eight weeks, I have a baby. So the baby is born with a small arm. You get it with me? That sounds crazy, right? Because we know that that's not hereditary. But keep in mind, these guys don't know anything yet about genes. We don't know yet what, uh, what DNA is. We understand that offspring resemble their parents, but we don't know how or why. So all of these are sort of um, important and significant hypotheses at the top. Yes? Okay. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit more about Lamarck and his acquired uh, inheritance of acquired characteristics. So this is one of his famous examples. Um, is the giraffe and its neck. So how does the giraffe get this long neck? Well, his explanation goes something like this, and you can sort of see it represented here graphically. You've got the ancestral giraffe with a relatively short neck compared to today's giraffe, right? So if you have a whole population of giraffes and they all have the same length of neck and they're all eating leaves from the trees. Okay, eventually all those leaves are going to get eaten and they're gone. So if you want something to eat, you probably need to stretch. Yeah, to reach some higher leaves. And over time, as this giraffe keeps stretching higher and higher to compete for food in the population of giraffes that we live in, he ends up with this super long neck. So stretching his neck leads to the long neck. Again, it sounds weird, but we know better now, right? They didn't really know this stuff. Um, and so then the theory continues that this giraffe with the long neck then would have offspring that were born with those long necks. Okay, sounds goofy, but it was a, it was a proposal and it was a hypothesis. Um, so, although eventually discredited, which we know now this doesn't happen this way, um, his ideas were influential because people are talking, right, about this stuff and investigating these things. So I want you to know who Lamarck is. All right, let's get to the real heavy hitters. Darwin and Wallace. So you guys all said Charles Darwin right off the bat. Who is Alfred Russell Wallace? Has anybody ever heard of him before? 
<laughs> if you've ever heard of Wallace, raise your hand. Couple of folks, okay. And usually there's at least one or two people in the room that have heard of him. Um, he's probably as important in the ideas that lead to our understanding of natural selection as Charles Darwin. But he gets like zero cred and zero publicity. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, so this is Darwin, this is Wallace. Wallace was significantly younger than Darwin, although they are they were contemporaries. They were living and working at the same time. Um, Darwin and Wallace both were paid naturalists, so they would get on ships and they would uh, go off to these faraway places. That keep in mind, back then in the 1800s, most people weren't traveling to different continents than the ones they lived on. Right? You have to be rich and have the time and have resources right, to go on these types of trips. So what people would do, even uh, wealthy people, would be to pay other individuals, naturalists like Darwin and Wallace, who would go on these trips, um, and they would bring back specimens of crazy looking things that you've never seen before. If you live in Great Britain, you've never seen uh, a Galapagos tortoise, right? So these naturalists would travel and they would bring back preserved specimens of birds and plants and butterflies and all kinds of stuff, and people would buy it. So it was like a lucrative career. So both Darwin and Wallace did that for a while, and they're both, um, you know, doing that to make money, but they're both also very interested in uh, the biology of it all. So they both would be considered naturalists at the time. Um, Darwin traveled to a lot of places, South America, Australia, Southern Africa. The Galapagos Islands is probably the most important, most influential, most well-known place that he went, okay? What do you guys know about the Galapagos? Have you heard of the Galapagos before in terms of Darwin's work? What's the, what's the species that is like super famous? Finches. Finches, right? So we'll spend some time talking about those finches, of course. So the Galapagos is off the coast of Ecuador. I'll show you guys a map in just a second in case you know Ecuador is not the same. Um, and Wallace spent some, a lot of time in the Brazilian rainforest studying insects. Um, but he also spent a significant amount of time in the Malay Archipelago. I'll show you where that is too in just a second. Um, and that's where they were basically looking at two different sides of the world, but looking at the same types of questions in those different places. A um, couple of things that the Malay Archipelago and the Galapagos Islands have in common, they're both islands, chains of islands. Um, let me see, I, have, I don't have a good picture of the Galapagos as an island group, but it's basically in this red circle, okay? A um, whole bunch of little tiny islands off the coast of Ecuador. And the Malay Archipelago is basically here in green. South <coughs> Australia, uh, North Africa. So that's where the Malay is. Again, an archipelago, a group of islands. So both that's important that they're both islands. Um, islands are important often for biodiversity because they are detached from the mainland. We'll talk more about this later, it'll make more sense. That's why I said there's more on this later. Um, when you have geographical areas that are detached from other geographical areas, you have a whole sort of separation going on or isolation of the species that live there. So their evolutionary trajectory is often very different than the related organisms that live on the mainland. So if the environment is different and they don't have any contact, there's no cross of genes, you often see unique things that live on islands. Okay, we'll talk more about that later, but that's why it's important that both of these um, locations are islands the other thing to keep in mind is the latitude. What is this line that the country of Ecuador is named for? The equator, right? It's right around the middle, zero degrees latitude. Look where the melee is. Same area, right? So these are both equatorial locations and they're both islands. So you get that island biodiversity factor, but you also get that latitude biodiversity factor. Um, we'll spend a lot of time looking at maps later in the semester about biodiversity. It tends to be hot around the tropics. And then what do you think happens to the number of species endemic or native to an area as you get closer to the pole? Higher or lower? Lower, right? So who lives at the North Pole? Polar bears, Arctic foxes, maybe? What about South Pole? Salmon, perhaps, right? Not much, yes? But what about uh, in the rainforest? Too many species to count, right? Super high diversity, and we'll talk about why later um, in more detail. But basically, you've got incredibly good growing conditions and living conditions. 
constant, uh, no real seasonality, no changes, no drastic changes in season, just a year long growing season with plenty of rain, plenty of food, plenty of habitat, lots of biodiversity. As conditions get less favorable for most forms of life, fewer and fewer species. Okay, so it's cool and notable and significant that both Darwin and Wallace are working in these two locations that are similar in biogeography and latitude. Okay. All right, so more on this story. Cool. You guys doing okay? All right. Let me give questions or comments. This is getting long winded here. Lots to talk about in this class. Um, okay, so let's talk about their idea. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. The red circle is the rock Yes. Down here in green. Yep. All right. So um, in 1858, Darwin. So Dar okay, let me rewind this a little bit. Darwin does not really know much about Wallace. Okay, because Wallace is a young guy, he's like in his 30s by this point in time, um, not well known in the sort of society of London. Okay, not, not a relative unknown, let's call it. Okay, so he's doing this work, but nobody really knows who he is. Now, Darwin is older and he's more established. His family is, he's got a reputation, he's like a uh, known to be an intellectual, he's known to be publishing things, like he's already a working scientist, um, and he has a reputation to protect. Okay, so he's a little bit more famous. Um, he's been writing this book, okay, this book that he's going to eventually call On the Origin of Species. You guys have heard of it, yes? That's like the book about evolution. Um, as it turns out, Darwin was going to make it like 12 volumes, huge collection of information, all based on things that he'd been learning in the Galapagos about species and how they change, and his predictions and his hypotheses about how this all works. Um, but he's not quite ready to publish it yet. Because it's radical, you guys. It's talking about changes in species due to natural selection, which again, not a popular concept at the time. Okay, people are still saying species don't change. Uh, this is blasphemy. This goes against our religious laws, like all these types of pressure. So he's got a lot to lose. And he's got a reputation. And so he's sort of like hesitant. He wants to really make sure he's got all of his ducks in a row before he publishes this uh, sort of groundbreaking material. Well, while he's thinking and writing and pondering and talking to his close circle of friends about these ideas about natural selection, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace is this young up and comer, and he's coming up with these same ideas, and he's like super excited about it. And he knows who Darwin is, because Darwin's already famous. So he sends Darwin a letter, and he's like, "Hey, look at this cool stuff that I found in Malay Archipelago. I think." organisms are influenced by their natural surroundings. And I think it's due to competition, and I think it's due to uh, heredity. And he's got this whole idea lined out, or outlined. Um, and it's exactly the same thing that Darwin is saying in his 12 volume series. So he is about to get scooped. Darwin is about to get scooped by this young up and comer. So Darwin goes to his closest friends who are also in the scientific community, and they say, Dude, you got to publish. You got to get this out here because this other guy is going to come out and he's going to he's going to get the credit for these ideas. So the thing that I love the most about this story is that most of the time when you're competing with somebody and like for any kind of recognition, you kind of want to like I don't know fight to the death over it. But instead of that, these two these two actually work together. So they publish together. They both go to the Linnaean Society, which is basically like going to I don't know a TED talk these days. Right, and present their information together on the same day. In fact, neither one of them actually went in person, but they sent proxies. So their information, their publications were made, made public um, on the same day to this society. So they shared credit. I don't know why we don't hear about Wallace, but he got, he got some recognition in the beginning. Well, then Darwin goes on to go ahead and publish his On the Origin of Species in the next year. But instead of publishing a 12 volume series, he publishes a single book which is also uh, considered to be really important um, or really a significant factor in why this book was so influential uh, or is as influential and as popular as it is. Because if you go on Amazon and you're looking for a book on natural history and there's one 150 page book that sums it all up or there's a 15 volume 
17,000 page series, which one are you going to buy? The short book, right? So the idea is that by writing it on in a shorter and accessible form, it actually reached more audiences than it would have if he continued working on all those volumes. But the only reason he didn't continue working on all those volumes is because this young up and start upstart kid Wallace comes to him and already has the same ideas as him. It's kind of a cool confluence of, of people in history. So that's an interesting story, right? Now you know a little bit more about that. But what's really important is the ideas that they both had in common. And they both came to these three conclusions independently of one another, working in two different places. The Galapagos for Darwin, Malay Archipelago for Wallace. The first um, principle that they describe is that characteristics are inherited. Now, the stuff in blue is new terminology. I think we know now. Right? It wasn't stuff that they knew then. So they both said, we observed that organisms have offspring and they pass those characteristics that make them good at what they do onto their offspring. Basically, children resemble their parents, young resemble their, their previous generation. Um, we now know that's genetics, right? That's carried in the gene pool of that population. Number two, principle that operates in nature that they both settled on was that resources are limited in any habitat, in any environment, there's more individuals, more offspring produced than their environment can support. So food is at a premium, habitat is at a premium. Sometimes it's mates that you compete for, but that organisms are always in competition with one another and there's not enough resources to go around. Okay, so you've got genes and you've got competition. Now, the fact that you have this competition introduced in every population ever is where you get the idea of survival of the fittest. You guys have heard that before, probably, right? In terms of evolution or natural selection. <laughs> this means that the, the organisms that are best suited to acquire those resources, the best competitors, are the ones that are going to get the resources, they're going to be more likely to survive. If they're more likely to survive, they're more likely to reproduce, right? And if they reproduce, they're going to pass on those characteristics that are inherited to their offspring. And we're now we're getting somewhere, right? We're getting to that definition of evolution. Um, and number three is that offspring vary among each other in their characteristics, right? So this sounds kind of like what we're already saying, but variation is really important concept as well. When we're talking about natural selection. If we know the characteristics are inherited, but if what if all offspring were identical? What if there was no variation in that population in that next generation? Everybody would have the exact same characteristics, everybody would have the same advantages and the same disadvantages. Who's going to be a stronger competitor? There's, there's no difference, right? So variation is critical for natural selection to actually do anything. Because if, if only the strong survive, or you're looking at survival of the fittest, but no one is the fittest, there's no, there's nothing for, for selective pressure to work on. Does that make sense? So it's important that there are inherited characteristics, but it's important that those offspring inherit different ones. So that there's variability or variation in those populations, so they can have an, an edge over one another as they're competing for resources. And those three things together are the principles that define natural selection. Okay? Good? All right, let's read through these bullets together and sort of pull it all back into a, a nice little summary. Um, so Darwin and Wallace both reason that individuals with inherited traits that make them more able to compete for those limited resources will be more likely to survive and produce more offspring compared to those less able to compete. That's what we just said, okay? Because traits are inherited, those traits will be more common in the next generation. That, my friends, is a change in the allele frequency in the gene pool of a population, yes? As, you, as those traits that make you a better competitor are passed on to the next generation and you start to see more of those traits in those next generations, those are changes. Changes in characteristics, but what leads to those characteristics, that's the genes under, underpinning them, right? So real frequency changes, we're getting back to that definition. This process leads, leads to changes in populations from one generation to the next. Darwin called it descent of modification, which is a really cool way to sort of simply describe it. Okay. As you see descending um, 
population, the specific generations, you see tweaks, right? Slight modifications from one to the next. And sometimes it's minor, and sometimes it's more uh, significant. So we'll look at some examples. And ultimately, natural selection leads to greater adaptation of the population to its local environment. It is the only mechanism known for adaptive evolution. When we're talking about adaptive evolution, we're talking about a fit to your local environment. Local means what? Where's local? Around here, right? Local environment means here and now, okay? So your environment that you're well suited for, can it change? Absolutely, it always does, right? That's the beauty of this world, the bio biological sciences. There's always something changing. So what is working well for you now, your local environment, that could change. It could change the next season. It could change two years from now. It could change 100 years from now, but it's probably going to change. So your, your fit of a particular organism or group of organisms is only good in that local environment. And then when that changes, the selective pressures change, and who has the advantage can change. Therefore, you see changes in characteristics from generation to the next, and boom, evolution. Yes? All right. Descendants modification? Yeah, it just basically means that as you, so have you ever heard the term descendants? Like you are the descendant of your grandparents and your parents. So as you have descending generations, each one you see slight modification, or just slight changes. So that was his sort of elegant way of putting that into a, a short, concise little statement descendants modification. This means that you make little adjustments. Selection makes nature makes small adjustments from one generation to the next. You guys doing okay? All right, you know this is a lecture heavy course. I right? see a lot of me talking. That's why anytime you have questions, comments, concerns, feel free to pop in. Uh, I welcome the break. Getting a little out of breath up here, kind of thirsty. Okay, let's talk about finches. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking about finches. One of the first papers that we'll look at in lab, um, we'll look at a finch paper. We'll talk about these because they're still, you guys, uh, scientists out there on the Galapagos doing research on fishes. It's been going on for hundreds of years now. It's actually pretty cool. So what did Darwin say about these fishes? So these are four different species. Um, three are in the same genus, one is in a separate genus, but they're all pretty closely related. These are all finches that live on different islands in the Galapagos, okay? So Darwin observed that they were fairly similar to one another and similar to species that live on the mainland. So this is, again, speaking to that island sort of isolation thing. There are relatives of these finches that live on the mainland, and Darwin noticed they're similar. But there are some distinct differences, and one of the major differences that he focused on was their beaks. So what does a bird do with its beak? It's, it's for feeding, right? So what does it mean if you have a different shaped beak, potentially, about what you're eating? Sorry? Yeah, you need something different, right? So this guy with this big, huge beak, magna rostra, that means big nose in Latin, um, or Greek, wherever that word comes from. I think it's Latin, anyway. Um, he's eating large seeds, probably, things that he can crack, right? If he's got a good uh, bite force with that big bill. What about this guy? It's a little small sort of needle, like tweezers almost. Maybe small soft seeds. Maybe he's picking insects out of the tree bark or flowers or something, right? But you can sort of imagine those special specialty um, diets that go along with different sizes and shapes of beaks. So we're going to use the seeds as our sort of example here. So he noticed that there's a graded series with slight differences between those that are most similar to one another, meaning that there's like a range, right? You can kind of see it here from big down to small. Right? So there's a series of differences. It's not like there's only this or this. There's kind of everything in between. Okay? Now, keep in mind, this is four examples of species, but there are many, many more species that you could put on a spectrum, okay? a beak size. Um, and you notice that these beak changes or, or differences in beak size and shape correspond with the types of food. So that's what we're looking at. 
Um, he also observed, and this is where it gets really interesting, and this is part of the work that's still ongoing in the Galapagos. Um, he observed that changes in frequency of beak shape each year correlated with changes in the predominant food supply. In the years where small seeds were more abundant, you would subsequently see more individual birds who had the smaller beaks that were better adapted to that particular food source. And in years where large seeds were more abundant and small seeds were more scarce, you can see the trend towards larger beaks. That doesn't happen immediately, right? Because an individual doesn't change, right? That's another misconception about evolution is that one thing turns into something else. These birds aren't changing their beaks over their lifetime, right? Magnorostris is born with a big gill, a big beak, and it stays big, right? Um, Fortis is born with a sort of medium sized bill and it stays that way. So these birds aren't changing, but what is changing is who is at the advantage? Who can get the most food? Those that get the most food are going to be the most successful in that season, meaning they're going to lay the most eggs and those eggs are going to hatch and you're going to see more of those birds with that particular trait that made them good at obtaining food in the first place. You guys with me? Okay, so this is a classic example of evolutionary biology in the philosophical center. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit in one of the papers, the, the first paper that we read in, in the lab is actually authored by Peter and Rosemary Grant. These, um, this is their couple. They've been working in the Galapagos since the 1970s, um, and they're still out there. So they're pretty old now, but they're still out there climbing around on the rocks in the Galapagos looking at pigeon banding birds, doing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so this is some data that came from a study that they did in the late 70s um, on Daphne in the Galapagos, just one of the islands. Um, and what this is showing you here is a change in beak depth, mean beak depth. What's mean? Do you guys know? Average, yeah. So in 1976, they had banded all the birds uh, that they could possibly catch on Daphne, so 751 birds. And they had every bird on the island in their hand at one point, a little band on the foot. They know like every bird on the island. Okay, we think about. Um, anyway, so they measured beak depth. So that's how wide it is from top to bottom. So it indicates crushing power. So probably the big magna rostra species to meet the big beak and then smaller ones and smaller stuff. So mean beak depth in 76, somewhere around nine and a half million. Okay, so that's all this graph is showing you. And you've got a distribution. You guys seen these before? Have you had statistics or math classes where you've seen these kind of graphs before? This just means more birds are right around the average, and then you have some outliers that there are fewer that get further away from that average. We're going to spend some time talking about that in lab two later. But this is basically just a graphical representation of all 751 birds, and that's where the mean beak depth falls in 1976. 1977, there's a drought. Okay, a pretty bad drought reduces the number of small seeds available because this, the plants that were um, less drought tolerant tended to be those that died off, which tended to be those with smaller seeds. So later you have only, if during that drought season, you have only large seeds available. So the next year in 1978, they count 90 birds. The sample size is a little different, but still you can see that the mean beak depth has shifted now to just over 10 millimeters. All right, so nine millimeters is nine and a half millimeters to 10.1, let's say. Is that a huge change? Not really, right? In terms of millimeters, it's pretty small. But in terms of data, it's statistically significant. Okay, what's significant about this is that that is a change that happened over one season, and they can tie it directly to that drought event. Does that make sense? So what you're looking at here is just one piece of data, one, two graphs from one study on Galapagos finches, but that's the kind of stuff that you're looking at. How do these characteristics change over time and what is influencing their changes? So these, uh, the grants in, in the 70s and their colleagues are working on exactly the same thing that Darwin was working on when he was just floating around on the beagle in the 1800s. It's kind of cool to think about. All right, more on the finches later. All right, let's talk a little bit more about variation and adaptation. So remember, natural selection can only occur if there's variation among individuals. That was that third principle that Darwin and Wallace both came up with as part of their hypothesis, was that organisms have to be different from one another so that one 
so that some of them have an advantage and some have a disadvantage or no change will happen. Um, and that variation has to be genetic, it has to be heritable. Okay, because if you um, stretch your neck to reach the highest leaves, you're not passing that on to your offspring. Okay, so that doesn't count in terms of variation and adaptation as it relates to natural selection. Um, but where does that variation come from? Why do you see differences in offspring? Um, anybody have siblings, brothers or sisters? If you are not an identical twin, okay, so if you are, then drop yourself out of the survey. Um, does anybody look exactly like your brother or sister? Like exactly, like people can't tell you apart. Not really, right? You might resemble, maybe you sound alike, maybe you have some things in common, maybe you have the same hair color or you both tall or whatever, but there's variation. But you have the same parents, right? So why aren't you identical? I want you guys to think back to bio one. Where does variation come from uh, in sexual reproduction? Let's specifically think about meiosis. Ouch, I'm asking you to go back to meiosis. What happened? What is meiosis? You guys remember mitosis, right? What's that? Cell, cell division. Yeah, sorry, I didn't interrupt you. I can't even tell who's talking in the mask. I can hear the direction that I can tell who's talking. Um, say that again, Al. Who's talking? That's my toes. Who answered that question? You want to say again? Okay. No worries. I just couldn't tell who was talking when I felt like I interrupted you. Okay, so mitosis is cell division. What's meiosis? It's also cell division, right? But what kind? Say again? Gametes. Making gametes, right? So reductional cell division. You're dividing genetic information in half. You're making gametes. What are gametes? Sex cells, sperm cells, and egg cells. What happens during meiosis to change the genetics of that are contained in those gametes? Do you guys remember crossing over? Maybe some of you are nodding. Oh gosh, you can ask me color. I won't. So the uh, sister chromatids line up, or homologous pairs line up, non sister chromatids cross over, right? Synapse and switch. So you end up with new combinations, right? Recombination of genetic material crossing over. Independent assortment, you guys remember that one? The line is during metaphase, but one and one and two and two, they don't have to line up in the same exact way, so you get some sort of mix in there too. This is not something I'm going to test you on. You already passed by the one, but I just want to remind you, right? There's this uh, way that genes are resorted or recombined during meiosis. So that's one way that you get variation in offspring. And then you take uh, different individuals, right, from the population that are related to each other, but then find other individuals that are related to each other, and you sort of mix and match that way too. So one of the major um, advantages to sexual reproduction is that remixing of genetic material. So you get variation, right? That makes sense, yes? All right, so sexual reproduction explains mixing of genes that already exist, of alleles that are already present in the gene pool, getting resorted and redistributed. But where do new alleles come from? Where does a new trait, how does a new trait appear? That's going to be through mutation, okay? So variation through sexual reproduction is important, but the ultimate source, the one and only place that you see a brand new allele, a brand new version of a gene pop up, is through mutation. What is a mutation? It's a change, right, in the DNA sequence. You guys talk about mutations in, in bio one, your genetic um, unit, probably. Does it happen a lot? Yes and no. So no and yes, right? Um, it happens all the time, but frequently uh, it's fixed. Right? And if you have mechanisms in place during mitosis, during meiosis, that look for those mutations and then can repair it before it's passed on. But sometimes they slip through, right? Sometimes the mutations slip through. Um, and sometimes it affects phenotype. So remember we just said genotype and phenotype. Yeah. Is mutation always considered a bad thing? It's not. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. So um, it might be neutral, which is neither, right? Not good or bad. Um, that was, let's see, I have a, a neutral uh, a neutral mutation. That means it has no effect on phenotype. So let's make sure we're good with genotype and phenotype. Some of you said, yeah, earlier. 
Um, genotype is the gene cell, the sequence, right? The A and D and D and D in whatever order. What's the phenotype? That physical characteristic, it's the outward expression of what that gene uh, produces, right? What the gene product is. So, phenotype is what you can see, it's the trait. Genotype is the like, genetic underpinning that's the reveal. Um, so, if you have a change in the DNA sequence that slips through past those uh, repair mechanisms and it makes it into the, another cell, it may not affect the phenotype at all, and that's a neutral mutation. So there is no pressure, no selective pressure whatsoever on a neutral mutation, because it doesn't change anything. Okay, if you just have an A where you used to have a G, and it doesn't change the protein that that gene codes for, it doesn't affect phenotype, doesn't have anything to do with natural selection. There's no selection for it or against it because it doesn't do anything. You guys with me on that? Correct. In that case. Now, you can also have mutations that are what we describe as deleterious, and that's bad. So that's where, usually that's what we think of, right? When we think about cancerous mutations, that's bad, right? If you think about a mutation that leads to a birth defect, that's bad. Or a mutation that makes you more likely to develop some sort of disorder, that's bad, right? Those are the ones that we talk about mostly, um, and they definitely exist. If you have a deleterious mutation, it affects your phenotype in a way that lowers your fitness. Yes? Makes you less good at competing in your environment, your local environment. There's going to be selective pressure on that deleterious mutation. Let's go back to our eye color example where I made up a weird story where for some reason blue-eyed individuals are more likely to get eaten by a predator. That would be a deleterious mutation. If, that, if it was a mutation that led to that blue-eyed color and that blue-eyed color made you more likely to get eaten, that's a deleterious mutation. Does that make sense? It affects phenotype and it does so in a way that puts you at a lower uh, a lower fitness in your local environment, puts you at a disadvantage. Yeah? Additionally, there are advantageous mutations or mutations that give you an edge, give you a benefit, make you a stronger competitor. Okay, so a mutation that, that leads to, I don't know, let's say, extra muscle fibers in your leg muscles that make you faster at running away from predators would be considered an advantageous mutation, yes? So mutations arise because DNA changes as it's being replicated. In your cells, every time mitosis happens, you have to make a new copy of your whole genome, right? Lots of mistakes happen, but like I said, your cells are good at fixing them, but not all the time. So statistically speaking, the numbers are quite mind-blowing how many divisions happen in an organism, in a multicellular organism that's complex like we are, millions of times in a year, right? So you're going to have mistakes. Sometimes those mistakes slip through. Many times they're neutral and don't cause any change at all, but sometimes they do. And whether or not that change in phenotype is beneficial or deleterious depends on the local environment. So it's always up in the air. Yeah. So Um, how are you talking about like genetic testing? Like as far as like the bad ones, the like the deleterious. Mm -hmm. We know those quite well because we have the effects of it and we know that something's wrong or whatever. But with adaptogenes or neutral, there's not necessarily like something that makes you like, uh oh. You know what I mean? Like so is there any way of knowing like if we if we really want to? What is that? Yeah, I think I know what you're asking. So let's say, for example, well, we'd have to be talking about humans, right? Yes. Probably. Um, you can have your entire genome sequence, and we have the human genome now, right? So we know what the what the human genome looks like and what codes for what, what alleles are normal. So you could screen your whole genome and look for things that are uh, abnormal, and then try to figure out if it's causing anything. Does that make sense? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. So you could, but probably super expensive, and also we don't really know what all the answers are to those questions. There are, however, um, those that we do know, right? Like let's say the BRCA2 mutation that leads you to be more likely to develop breast cancer in your life. You guys heard of that mutation? Probably, right? It's pretty well known. 
So you can have a, a genetic test done to screen for that particular mutation, and then you know if you have it or not, and then you can decide if you want to act on that. Does that sort of answer what you're talking about? So now the other thing with neutral or advantageous, um, you don't really know that it is neutral or advantageous until the environment changes. Does that make sense? So something that might give you an advantage. Um, let's see, a good example in human evolution would be uh, the gene for lactose persistence. So anybody in here lactose intolerant? You don't have to share if you are, but it's um, pretty common in the human population. So some people have continued to produce, uh, I said lactose, I meant lactase, the enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is milk sugar, yes? So some people can drink milk, uh, through their whole life, and they digest it just fine because they continue to produce lactase, which is the enzyme that let, allow you to break down that sugar. If you don't continue to make lactase into your adult years, which is the ancestral condition, by the way, like most people used to not be able to drink milk past infancy, if you didn't need to, or you didn't need to digest lactose, um, that's a mutation in the human genome that turned on or leaves on the production of lactase, which is the enzyme that breaks down the milk sugar. You guys follow me? Okay, so that's an advantageous, advantageous, advantageous mutation. If you have the switch flips that keeps your lactase enzyme um, cranky. But it's only advantageous if you live in a society where you are uh, an agricultural society where you have animal milk to drink. If you don't, it doesn't matter. It's a neutral mutation. And if you do, then it gives you a survival advantage and it becomes an advantageous mutation. But it depends on the, where you live and what time of the world history you live in. Does that make sense? So there's no real way to know. You could screen your genome all day long and you could say, this is different. This goes C, where it used to say D. What's going to happen? You don't know. Does that, does that answer your question? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, so that's how mutations work. And we'll talk about that more throughout the semester as well. Remember, this chapter is the basis for everything else. Um, do you have a recessive attributes, right? So basically, you have more of that variation for dominant evolution. Sure. Okay. So when you get into recessive versus dominant, right? You first of all, you have to be. Uh, it has to be a Mendelian trait, right? That that works that way. That it has either either or. So with recessive, you have to have two copies of the same one, or it doesn't express. A dominant will mask recessive, right? So sure, it's possible that a recessive gene or a recessive allele, we should say, could be uh, a tr could go for a trait that gives you an edge, but you have to have two copies in order for it to uh, for, to show as a phenotype. So the same one with that Yeah, absolutely. So in this, let's say you have a mutation that arises that codes for an allele that gives you an advantage in your local environment, but you've got to have two copies. What's going to happen is if it gives you a strong enough advantage, then that allele is going to become more and more and more common in the population over time until that trait becomes super common because it's so advantageous. So that would require a strong selective pressure for that trait. Does that make sense, you guys? These are really good questions that lead to really good examples. And then you see uh, that recessive allele that started out as a mutation gain frequency in the gene pool of the population, and what is that? Changes in the allele frequency of the population. Evolution. Ding, ding, ding. Awesome. And we're two minutes over, so this is the perfect place to stop. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, we're doing great. We're making good progress. You guys are awesome. Um, I will see you Wednesday. Monday is an okay holiday, right? So I'll see you guys on the next day.